one of the greatest issues in, in this passage as we're going to unwrap that this morning, facing the church and facing the Corinthian church and why Paul wrote those four letters to the church in Corinth, and we, of which we have to. Um, but one of the issues that he faced there and was dealing with all the time, as we just barely addressed last week, was this issue of division. Ikes. I've been in churches where there's been such division and such skirmishes and such problems um, that the church basically just falls apart and, and some churches even get to the point of ceasing to exist. And it seems as if this issue of division has been a problem amongst God's people for centuries, literally centuries. And not only centuries, but thousands of years. Because the church has been around for about 2,000 years now. And it's been an issue in the church for 2,000 years. And guess what? It is still an issue in God's economy, in God's church. But it shouldn't be. And almost every New Testament letter that we find in God's Word will address this issue of this, this problem of, 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 of division in the church. Even the 12 apostles didn't get along always. Isn't that amazing? It's just like when you meet someone, it doesn't mean to say that you're going to click and you're going to mesh and you're just going to get on like, like, a, like a house on fire, which is a bad illustration. I never even thought of why they would even say that. I mean, a house on fire is not good, right? But we, we do get on well with one another. Imagine for a moment this, this, this problem of division. If you're a coach and, you, and you're coaching your team and there's division in your team, how, how well does your team then actually perform and function if there's division in the team? Imagine now they, we, we, they're on the court and, and, and they start arguing with one another and they start bickering and, and this one's got this problem, this one's got that, and, 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 and nothing seems to be going on, going on well. And so Paul comes along, he says, wait a minute, guys, we need a time out here. Wait a minute, we need a time out. And so he, he, he arrests the whole problem of division. Paul recognized in the church at Corinth that there was division. And he was calling the church in Corinth for a time out. And I believe that in every single church where there's division, God calls that church to a time out. The Corinthians' lack of unity was obvious to Paul. It was there for many, many years, as I addressed last week. They'd been playing in the same uniform, but they weren't united. It, they looked like they were the same thing. They were the same team, but there was division. And if there's division in a team, the team cannot function. It will never score. It will never have any points. It will never win. The problem wasn't so much that the differences of opinion, but there was divided allegiances that was happening in the church at Corinth. The allegiances weren't there. Yeah, they, they say they love Jesus. But in, in actuality, did they really love Jesus? They were arguing about which position in the team was the most important in a way that, that, that affected the team in such a negative way that, that Paul had to write this letter and address the situation that was going on in the church. They were on the field, but they were out of the game, kind of. They looked like a church, but they weren't really functioning as a church. What, what Paul had in mind, and he, and he switches, and, and he addresses this issue of division, and he says, guys, you need to be united. He argues that there is no excuse for divisions amongst believers. There is no excuse to have division amongst the church. He writes this, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church, rather be of one mind, united in the thought and purpose. I want us to look at those first couple of words. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wasn't talking here on his own authority. He's talking as he was the mouthpiece of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He's saying to the church, I appeal to you by the authority, not Paul's authority, but of the authority of God himself to be together in harmony with one another. Paul was, exalt, was, was exhorting the believers to come together in unity. Imagine if you and I had this huge problem amongst one another. Just imagine that we can't resolve issues. Just imagine how bad that would be. 
we'd come up to a person, listen, I really try to help you with your screwed up theology and your, your, your weird thinking and your messed up ideas about your theology. But you just wouldn't listen because you, you just don't get it. I, I, I suppose you don't have the intellectual capacity to understand what I'm trying to get at. How do you think that person would feel? Not too good. And guess what was happening in the Corinthian church? This is exactly what was happening. People were bickering with one another. They were fighting it with one another. Or maybe you disagree about what kind of song you need to sing, or what kind of music a church ought to have, or what kind of children's and youth programs should look like. And people bicker and go back and forth in a church, and they cause huge problems. And that's what was happening even in the church. And it happens in the church today. And it's so unfortunate. This is not the first conversation like this. Tensions are high. I've doubted your godliness. I even wonder if you're really a Christian. I wonder if you've got common sense. And suddenly, as we're bickering with one another, there's this huge bright light that appears. Jesus shows up. And he looks at me in the face, and his eyes are so bright and, and I, that I have to hide my, uh, my face from him. And he says to me, do you love me? And I stammer and I say, yes, Lord, I love you. And then he looks at you. And he asks you, do you love me? And you reply, yes, Lord, you know how much I love you. And then he says these words. Then I command you to work this out. I'll give you the grace, I'll give you the patience to forgive, to recalibrate, to reset on what really matters to me. But if you love me, you'll fix this relationship. Isn't that what Jesus says to us? That if we really love him, we would fix broken relationships. Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, not by his authority, and I want you to get this passage, but by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. That's what Paul is, 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 is longing for in the church at Corinth. Does it seem real that we could live like that in harmony? Is this a reality? Is it even possible for believers to, be, to live like that? to be of one mind, to be united in thought and purpose. Is it even possible to be in one mind, to be united, to be perfectly united, that there is no division in the church? Is this possible, to have no division in the church? You see, the Greek word for division is schism. It literally means to be cut apart. And what Paul was saying is that we shouldn't take Jesus Christ and cut him apart. It's so graphic, that illustration, that, that when Paul said this to the church in Corinth, they had this vision of literally cutting Christ and separating his, from bone from bone, from ligament to ligament, actually cutting Jesus up. And he says, don't do that. Remember that Paul had founded the church in Corinth. He was the one who established the church. Now, 18 months later, after he'd left the church, there was these arguments and these divisions that were occurring in the church, and it grieved the heart of Paul. And if it grieved the heart of Paul as he wrote to them about the authority of Jesus Christ, it was grieving the Lord Jesus himself. Paul was a good coach, and he wanted to clear up the confusion about what was right and wrong. He wanted to remove the obstacles of disunity. That was what any good coach would do. And because Paul was an apostle, he had the right to appeal to the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by, by virtue, you and I this morning, as we read his epistle, his epistle is shared even in the church today. You and I are the recipients of his epistle. Apparently, Paul's authority had come into question by some of the members of the Corinthian church. Paul wasn't simply appealing to them on the basis of his own authority, but he was appealing to them on the basis of Christ's authority and the authority that Jesus had given to him. He told the believers to stop arguing, to stop bickering, to stop fighting amongst themselves. 
He'd heard about these arguments from some of the very members of the church. They'd probably contacted Paul, maybe through a letter or, or through a delegate, and they sent him word of what was happening in the church. And Paul writes in, 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 in the 11th verse, For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. He's, he's, he's been informed of what's happening. You see, having factions and cliques in a church is bad. It's really, really, really bad. There's nothing good about having factions and cliques within a church. Imagine for a moment you're sitting in Sunday morning in the church in Corinth, and, you, and, and you're waiting for the, the teacher to get up, and, the, and, and, and Pastor Joe gets up and he says, Now, guys, we've just got a letter here from the Apostle Paul. And, he, and I just want to read this to you. And you say, wow, Paul, man, he, we, we, Paul wrote to us. Isn't that amazing? And so he, this is the letter. He says, listen, guys, I hear you guys are all fighting. And one group says, we follow Paul. And another group says, and sitting in a different section, and we, we follow Apollos. And another group maybe sitting on this section over here says, but we follow Peter. Don't you get, why don't we sit together? And we have these factions. And then the, the more holy than thou group of people who probably sit like in the front row, they say, well, hey, we follow Jesus. And so we see these factions of, of what was happening in the church and, and how it was dividing the church. Imagine you receiving a letter like that. Imagine a church that you're part of getting a letter like that from the apostle. Now, the teachers that are mentioned there, Apollos and, 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 and Peter, these were great teachers. They were eloquent. They were great in communicating the gospel. They were prominent in the early church. And in just a few couple of chapters, Paul talks about how he came and he, he, how he planted the seed in the church at Corinth. And then how later on, Apollos came and he, and he, and he watered. And then he says, but God brought the increase. You see, they were working collaboratively here in the church, building the church together. In 2 Corinthians, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, he says, I planted the seed in your hearts. This is what Paul says. But Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. All glory to God. The problem wasn't with Apollos. The problem wasn't with Peter. It wasn't the problem with, with Jesus. It wasn't a problem with even Paul. None of them had a problem. Jesus loved all three, and they loved Jesus. It's likely that each brought a different angle to the gospel. Each had a different way of communicating. But every teacher who does that it has, has a special, unique way of communicating. That's why I love the diversity of our church. I'll speak one way. Pastor Sharon will speak another way. Pastor Joe, Pastor James, we all speak in a different way. We teach differently. We communicate a little different. But each one is so important, and each one brings something to the body of Christ that we can be edified and be built together. It's a good thing. And it's better to have that than just one particular teacher all the time, all the time. I love that, the diversity. And you've, we're probably better off as we come to a Bible study. We have another teacher, maybe like James MacDonald, and he'll come share and then we'll have another Bible study and we'll hear Louis Giglio share. And so we even have teachers that are outside of our church and we're being fed by the different teachers, but we're all saying the same thing, is love Jesus with all your heart, with all your might, with all your strength. We don't have to agree on every single point. That's not what Paul was saying. He's not talking about that kind of unity. To be perfectly united doesn't mean that Paul required us to act exactly the same. It's not possible. Paul and Peter had different things. They had different ways of communication. But they did agree on one thing, about the love for the Lord. Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas had disagreements. Amongst those who were even saved, there was a diversity. And, 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 and they, they, and, but they even had a split up because they didn't agree on something. But they both loved the Lord. Divisions between believers work like brick walls or barbed wire fences, they undermine the effectiveness of the message that believers proclaim. You see, when we disagree, we fight with one another. It's, it's like someone's breaking the foundation that Christ established in our lives. 
The factions in the Corinthian church threatened to destroy it, to wipe it out. And that will destroy any church. It will wreck a church when there's schisms and divisions. We need to focus on our coach. We need to focus on Jesus Christ. He is the one who gives us purpose. He is the one that we focus on. We are the ones who take the light that Christ has shone into our lives, and we take that into the world. We were all baptized into the name of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? That all of us have been baptized into the name of Jesus. Every one of us. We have this relationship with Christ. He writes, Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? And he says this question rhetorically, of course not. I thank God that I didn't baptize any of you except Crispus and Caius. From the, for now no one can say we were baptized in my name. Oh yes, I baptized the household of Stephanus. I don't remember baptizing anyone else, he says. For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news. And not with clever speech, for fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. In this passage, Paul poses us, gives us three rhetorical questions. What are those rhetorical questions as we think about them? What are the three questions? And a rhetorical question, he gives us the answer. He's like putting it out there and then he answers it for himself. He says, is Christ divided? Obviously we say, no, of course not. Christ is not divided. It, it's impossible. And, and again, like that, that picture that he paints there, when by just asking that question, is Christ divided? split up of course not christ is one the church of jesus christ is one we are one body in christ just as jesus is one the church should never split into warring factions never ever should a church go down that path and if we find ourselves ever in a church going down that path we need to stop immediately and arrest it and address it because that's what christ wants of us never to go down that path Paul didn't point out any errors or flaws in the teachings of either Peter or Apollos. He, he said that they were great. They were good teachers. They all taught the same thing. They taught the good news. They taught the gospel. That's, now, if someone speaks in error or, or speaks falsity or speaks heresy, of course we have to address that. But if we're saying the same thing and we're teaching that Jesus Christ is who he is, we shouldn't then have divisions or cliques in the church, or within the church, as there was in the Corinthian church. There shouldn't be that in the church today. So many churches have different styles of worship. And we, as believers, can get caught up in that. And we miss the mark, what Christ calls us to. Some would say, listen, my preacher is better than yours. I've been in conversations like that. How dare we say that? He might be different, but if he's preaching the gospel, for goodness sake, agree with it. We're building God's kingdom. Many people follow personalities, and they even change churches based on what is popular or who is popular. We should never do that as believers. We shouldn't just leave here because something is not quite to our perfection, or we think that unless a person is speaking heresy, then you have a great reason, or if a person is living in sin and they refuse, then we have a reason. But if we, the gospel is being preached and the word of God is going forth, we need to stick together as the body of Christ. Now I look at the church in America and I look at the church worldwide, even in South Africa. If the pastor's not wearing the correct tie or the proper shoes, whatever, people get upset about that and they leave. Or if the worship team pushes a wrong note, they'll leave and find another worship team. Or they, or, or they get confronted through the Word of God and they feel a little uncomfortable and so they get upset. I want to go to church and feel nice. That's not what church is about. The church is to build us and to strengthen us and encourage us and also to challenge us, church. That's the gospel. To act this way is to divide Christ again. Jesus Christ is not divided and His true followers should not allow anything to divide the body of Christ. We shouldn't allow things. And folks, if there's someone that's trying to cause division, you who are more mature than that person need to address that and say, listen, you're dividing the church. You are going contrary to what the Scriptures teach. 
have the authority. Jesus has given you that from His Word. We need to be careful that we don't let our appreciation of a teacher or a speaker or a writer lead us into intellectual pride. Oh, he speaks so well, or she speaks so well, or they write so well, and this is... Don't let that happen in one's life. That's exactly what was happening in the Corinthian church. And Paul has to address that, and he did address it. The believer's allegiance must be to Jesus and to Jesus alone, and for the sake of the unity of the body of Christ. Paul had refused to go along with that, and, and, and he refused to accept that kind of division in the church. It had to be stopped. He had to address it. And the second rhetorical question that Paul asked, had Paul been, been crucified for them? Again, it's a rhetorical question. Of course he hadn't been crucified. Jesus had been crucified. There's only one who had been crucified for them to pay the penalty for their sin, and his name is Jesus. Paul never did that. And so he addresses them and says, listen, it wasn't me that was died for you. It was Jesus. And the third question he says, were you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. You baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Keep in mind that baptism is an important matter in the body of Christ. Baptism as it was in those days is just as important as it is today. When a sinner trusted and was baptized, he would cut himself off from the old life and was often rejected by family and friends because of this. It's like they made, when you, were baptized, when you are baptized, you make a public profession of your faith in Jesus Christ. It always costs something to be baptized in Paul's day. It may, may, may have meant separation. It was being kicked out of the church or, or out of the temple, whatever the case may be. But you made this declaration of your faith in Jesus. Paul reminded the believers at Corinth that they had been baptized into the one who was crucified for them. You and I as believers, we've been baptized into the name of Jesus, the one who's been crucified for us. Paul didn't minimize the importance of baptism, but he put baptism in its proper perspective because the Corinthians were making baptism something much more than what it was supposed to be. They were making a big issue of it. His point is that baptism, regardless of who baptized us, is important because it binds us brings us together in Christ. It binds us to Jesus. That's what's so important, church. Does, it have, does, does a person have to be baptized by the pastor? Not particularly, no. The point is that we are baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. That's who we belong to. And that declaration of baptism is saying, I belong to Christ. I don't belong to Pastor Steve or to the Nazarene church. I, I belong to Jesus. And that's why baptism is so important. It is a public declaration of your loyalty. It is a loyalty oath to Jesus. It is wrong to identify any man's name with your baptism other than the name of Jesus Christ. I've heard kids say, I remember Pastor Steve when you baptized me. No, remember Jesus. Remember Jesus. That's who we baptize in. Never forget that it is Christ alone who binds us together. And without Jesus, we're nothing. And at the very end of the book of, of Corinthians, Paul has a stern warning to the church. And I believe this warning is for every single believer. He says that if anyone does not love the Lord, that person is cursed. Yikes. If you don't love Jesus Christ, you're putting a curse upon your own life. And everyone that you rub shoulders with or you encounter that doesn't love Jesus is under a curse, under their own curse. Paul tells us that. Christian unity takes work and it takes grace from God. It doesn't just fall in our lap. We need to work at that. It brings us together as a church. Paul's rhetorical questions lead him to the note that, 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 that how, much he, how, how many people he baptized. And, and his note was that he didn't baptize very many. His message was to preach the gospel. There were other people probably baptizing. Maybe Apollos was baptizing. Maybe Peter was baptizing. Maybe the heads of the church there were baptizing. It's clear that he wasn't trying to make disciples for himself. Had he have done that, he would have baptized as many as he could. And they would all say, listen, Paul... I follow Paul. He baptized me. That wasn't the issue. Jesus was the issue for Paul. Believers are not baptized into different leaders. We are baptized into the family of believers through Jesus Christ. 
Baptism replaced the rite of circumcision as the initiation rite of the new order, the new covenant. That's what baptism symbolized. It wasn't more than that. It is a public profession of our faith. For believers, it was only one baptism by which they publicly acknowledged their one faith in the one Lord. Paul says in verse 17, For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news, not with clever speech, for fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. Remember that Paul wasn't minimizing the importance of baptizing. He wasn't just pushing it aside. Instead, he was pointing out that his gift was the ministry of preaching, and his gift was sharing the gospel. And even if the preaching of the gospel can even cause division. What? Even the preaching of the gospel? Yes, because again, people will follow different teachers, and they'll say, this is my teacher. I, I, I can't listen to anyone else. It's got to be this individual. And so oftentimes, some of the individuals that the believers, well-meaning believers are listening to, are missing the mark. They're not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to listen to what the Word of God says. Always go back to see if this is what God's Word says. Paul didn't depend on his rhetoric or his philosophical arguments that he would win some arguments because that would have emptied the gospel. It would have emptied the power of the gospel. He took the Word of God which he'd received from Jesus and he shared that boldly with confidence, knowing that the authority that he was sharing it with was from Jesus himself. Today, preaching the good news is about as low-tech as we could ever get. There's nothing technologically fantastic about preaching the good news. It was never meant to be like that. The good news message has not lost its power. And that's the way that God had set it up in the Word of God. But there are those in the church today that believe otherwise. Think about this for a moment. When was the last time you went to a movie? Anyone? Come on, don't you guys don't go to movies? All right, okay. When if you think about the last movie you saw, that movie's budget was probably well over a hundred million dollars. It cost a lot to produce that hour and a half or two hour flick that you went to go see. That movie, being a hundred minutes long, comes out to about a million dollars a minute as you're watching that movie. A million dollars a minute, right? Now think about the Super Bowl commercials. Three million dollars for 30 seconds. Eh? Three million dollars for 30 seconds. Which is about six million dollars a minute. How much more expensive are the Super Bowl ads than even a movie? Six times the price. When I prepared this message, I didn't have a $210 million budget. It would be great if I did. But I didn't. It simply cost me a couple of cups of coffee, some paper, a computer, and some typing, and that was it. And obviously, God, the Holy Spirit, breathing life into the Word of God. But we come with this idea of, of what entertainment ought to be because we're so used to that and we transpose that into the church and we think it's got to be the same. The gospel comes from God himself with power and authority by God the Holy Spirit, not by fancy things. Yes, we use audio. Yes, we use PowerPoint. And I think if Jesus were around, he'd probably use that as well so we could get the word of God. But it doesn't cost us millions of dollars. And have you ever thought why God would choose something like preaching to communicate the truth to us? Why would God do that? Why would he take the most simple, cheapest thing to communicate? Because it's supernatural. It comes from God himself. Paul knew that his message and preaching didn't have wise and persuasive words of eloquence. He said he maybe even struggled with communication. But it came in the demonstration of God the Holy Spirit. You see, he was filled with the Spirit of God. There was something divine. There was something supernatural that was going on. Nothing man manufactured. Didn't have a million dollar budget or two million dollar budget or whatever budget it is. It came simply with the power 
of God the Holy Spirit. Remember what the Bible says. When he wrote to the church in Rome, he said, So faith comes from hearing. That is, hearing the good news about Christ. That's where faith comes from. It doesn't come from a big movie, an expensive movie. It doesn't come from that. It comes from hearing the good news. And through the preaching of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, drunks get sober. Addicts get set free. It's through the preaching of the good news that self-loathing dissipates and we find new meaning and purpose for life to live for Jesus. It's through preaching that stubborn hearts awaken to the plight of the poor. It's when the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and, and touches our heart through His Word. Let me remind you that Jesus is the example that you and I follow. It is Him that we focus on. Jesus had everything. He had all the power. He had the divine privilege. He had the divine prerogative. And yet He gave it all up, as we read in Philippians. He, he, he came and He left that all behind to become like us, that, he could re, that we could relate to Him. The Bible says He emptied Himself and He came down to earth. He was beaten, He was despised, He was killed. And He, he stripped it all away. For you and I. So that you and I don't have cliques. That you and I don't fight and bicker with one another. But He came to bring us together as His church in unity and in His oneness. That's Christ's desire. And when Jesus formed this new community of faith called the church, He formed it around Himself. He didn't form it around some new teaching, but around Himself. It was built on something totally different something unique, something marvelous, something transformative, something amazing, something miraculous. You see, the church is built on that fact. There's only one place where we can all come together, and that is at the cross or at the foot of the cross. That's what unites us together as believers. And that's what was, should have been happening in the church at Corinth. That they'd taken their eyes off Jesus. They'd taken their eyes off the cross. And they were focusing on people rather than on Jesus. You see, when we walk away from the cross to form our own cliques, even over theological differences, we've emptied our, ourselves of the power of the cross that transforms us. Listen, I have brothers and sisters that I love dearly that aren't part of the Nazarene church. But they love Jesus. And that's what binds us together. I happen to be in the Nazarene church and you and I this morning because we believe in its mission. We believe in, in what's going on, worldwide even. Does that mean to say I'll be Nazarene all my life? I don't know. If the church goes off tracks and starts, and starts preaching heresy, I won't remain with the Nazarene church because I want to remain faithful to Jesus, not to a denomination. I remain faithful to Christ who's called us. And that's the important thing, church. If we walk away from the cross, we lose our ability to impact the world. You see, you and I are responsible, and we are not to let that happen in our lives or within our community of faith. Salvation only comes because Jesus died for us. All that enriches us and exalts us and unifies us comes through Jesus Christ. Nothing else will bring us together but the cross of Christ. And when Paul sees how the church in Corinth already reverted to its old way of thinking and following individuals, they were losing the power of God in their church. And Paul didn't want that to happen. He didn't want its poisonous, toxic spirituality to go forward. He had to address that. He wanted to get rid of it in the church because it was poison, and poison kills. That's why Paul called the church in Corinth for a time out. And if you were to look at East Rockway Church of the Nazarene, I wonder this morning if he would call us to a time out. Or he would write us a wonderful letter and say, guys, just keep on doing what you're doing. Focus on Jesus. Keep on focusing on him. And I love the unity that I find within the congregation. I want to affirm to you this morning, that if you are striving for that in, your ch in, in our church, 
striving for oneness and striving for unity, striving to build one another up, I encourage you, I affirm you, I commend you. But on the other hand, if you find yourself, or if you've been part of something that's, that, that's tearing down or breaking up, I hope that you repent of that and ask Jesus to forgive you. The Lord wants us to leave those clicky, toxic impulses outside so that when we come into the church, we'll find community. That we'll come together as one, as the body of Christ. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 133, and I'm going to read it to you, or you can open up your Bibles or if you want to read that. But the psalmist wrote about this, and he, and he said, how wonderful and how pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. I'm thinking brothers and sisters. He says how wonderful and how pleasant it is when we dwell together in harmony. And then he writes, For harmony is as precious as the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head and ran down his beard and onto the border of his robe. And then he writes, Harmony, this oneness, is like the refreshing dew from Mount Hermon that fell on the mountains of Zion. And there the Lord pronounced his blessing, even life everlasting. And, and if you think, if you, ever, if you know any about the geographic conditions in Israel, there's Mount Hermon, and it's usually snow-capped. And the dew that comes from there would blow over, over Zion, which, which is the hills of Jerusalem. And it would moisten and it would be damp. And God says, and there the Lord has pronounced his blessing, and life everlasting. Where? is where there's harmony. And he compares the harmony as the dew, as the moisture that holds us together and nourishes us. It's like the anointing that, 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 that the priest received when they went into the priesthood. It's the anointing that you and I receive from God himself when we have this unity. We find unity and we'll find love. When we find oneness, we discover love. I want to close this morning by encouraging each one of us, you and I together, to apply the truths of God's Word, to strive for unity, and not let bickering or let any kind of click ever come into our congregation. It's been there in the past, and I've addressed it. But in the future and presently, if you're guilty of anything like that, stop. Stop. We're here to build God's kingdom, His church, and when we come together, we do it so that His name is glorified. That it's always around Jesus and not around anyone else. When we find unity, we'll find love. And folks, I believe that if Jesus would do, were, were, were physically to come here this morning, He'd look at our hearts and I think He would commend us in doing that. And say, I love how you guys love one another. We love you. Sharon and I love you guys. And let us love one another with the same love that we've received from Jesus himself. Amen. Amen. Praise